Hello class, welcome to the final segment in lecture 20. And in this final segment, we are going to cover one other type of uh, non-traditional frontal boundary that we can see in the atmosphere, which is referred to as a sea breeze front. But other terms for this are sea breeze circulation and the opposite cycle can be a land breeze circulation or a land breeze front. And uh, much like, uh, much like uh, an outflow boundary, it's primarily a mesoscale phenomenon and it separates uh, cool moist air from warm moist air as opposed to a more traditional cold front which separates uh, warm moist air from cold dry air. So let's actually take a look at how these sea breeze circulations or sea breeze fronts actually form in the atmosphere. And if you remember back to our frontogenesis equation from lecture 19, uh, there was one term in there called the differential diabetic term and that's the primary term that comes into play here when we talk about a sea breeze circulation. So in a typical setup for a sea breeze You've got some sort of interface between land and water, so you've got some sort of coastline in the vicinity. And a lot of times this happens near the equatorial regions where the sun's heat is most intense. And if you're going to be looking at, say, uh, somewhere farther north, so say like the, the uh, Florida coastline or the Gulf coastline or even parts of the Carolinas and Georgia, uh, in order to get this to happen, this typically has to happen during the summer, or the late spring uh, summer and to some extent the uh, early fall months, that's when you would see something like this at, at those particular regions. But in the tropical regions, this happens pretty much year round. So, of course, the sun's intensity is the heat, the, the intensity of the sun's heat is one key factor. And the reason why is because uh, this is all driven by differences in specific heat capacity. So, you may remember back from physics and chemistry classes, uh, substances that have a high specific heat capacity are it's harder to change the temperature of those substances. And water has a very high specific heat capacity. It takes a lot of heat energy to increase or decrease the temperature of water, of liquid water. And land, on the other hand, has a very low specific heat capacity. It's relatively easy to change the temperature of, say, uh, a rock face, which is typically what you have over land, or some sort of urbanized landscape or grass or something. It's just easier to increase or decrease the temperature of land than it is to increase or decrease the temperature of a body of water. So in the height of the afternoon, when the heating is most intense, you've got a rapid temperature increase occurring over land because of the low specific heat capacity. So land has lower specific heat capacity, so it's easy to raise the temperature over land. And over water, it's harder to change the temperature of the water, of the body of water. So during the daytime, you end up with a relatively warm air mass over the land and a relatively cold air mass over the water. And you may remember back when we were talking about the dry line in segment one, we were talking about how typically the vertical, mo the upward motions occur where the air is less dense. And in this case, the air is less dense over land because it's got, you got we're going to assume it's got, got roughly the same amount of moisture, but over land it's warmer. Since the uh, air over land is warmer, that means it's less dense. So that's where the upward vertical motions are going to be. And in order to maintain continuity, you've got upward vertical motions. That means you've got some sort of convergent flow pattern, which typically involves the cooler uh, air over the water moving towards the warmer air over the land. And so you end up with what looks like sort of a cold front, a uh, cold front on boundary, even though technically cold front usually has cold dry air on the cold side, this has cold moist air on the cold side. And uh, if you look at the, how this cold front is moving, it's moving by moving from the cooler air to the warmer air, it's moving from the water to the land. And that's where the term sea breeze comes into a, comes into play because the air, the, uh, the wind, you get sort of a wind current that's moving from the water to the land and a lot of times this does trigger thunderstorm activity during the summertime. So you may have heard the term sea breeze thunderstorms. That's what's meant by a sea breeze thunderstorm. It's a thunderstorm that's developed or it's developing in response to this current of colder air that's moving inland. It's moving toward the land which is of course kicking off thunderstorm activity over land. And to maintain, again just to maintain continuity, so this is just an application of the mass continuity equation we looked at in lecture 8, You've got rising motion, you've got divergence aloft, and then if you've got seeking motion, you've got convergence aloft. So this that base by the mass continuity equation, you basically end up with a vertical circulation that looks something like this. So rising motion over the land, and then seeking motion over the water. And again, if the conditions are favorable, you can get thunderstorms forming over land. Now let's take a look at what happens during the nighttime. So again, same idea as before, a difference in specific heat capacity that's going to cause an imbalance in temperature that Mother Nature will then try to resolve in some shape or fashion. So again, same idea. Specific heat capacity over water is much higher than it is over land, so it's much harder to change the temperature of the water than it is to change the temperature of the landmass. 
So during nighttime, with the loss of the sun's heating, the landmass tends to cool off much more rapidly than the water cools off. So that means you're going to have relatively cold temperatures over land and relatively warm temperatures over water because it takes a lot longer for the temperature to fall over water than it does over land. So during the nighttime, you end up with relatively cold temperatures over land, relatively warm temperatures over water. And now the circulation basically reverses direction. So now you have rising motion. Again, it's the same mechanism as before, just now that you're warm, moist, and lower density air is over water. So this is where your rising motions are going to occur during the nighttime in this pattern. And again, to maintain continuity, you've got to have some sort of convergent flow pattern if you've got rising motion, and that in turn will produce a current of cold air that moves from the land to the water. And that's where the term land breeze comes into effect. Now the current of air is blowing from the landmass over towards the water. And again, if the conditions are favorable, this could be where you can get some thunderstorms to develop. And just to maintain continuity here, uh, you're going to have, if you got wind that's converging towards rising motion, that means you've got a divergent pattern here, which means you've got sinking motion, and that's ultimately going to result in a vertical circulation that looks something like this. And you'll talk more about the mathematics of these uh, vertical circulations in the presence of frontal boundaries. That'll be its subject in some of your later dynamics courses. But for now, you just need to remember that typically, if you've got a frontal boundary, the side that has the less lower density air is going to be having the rising motions, and the higher density air is going to be having the sinking motions. So that's going to do it for this final segment on sea and land breezes. And in the next lecture, we are going to discuss the concept of buoyancy. So with that, I will see you all in the next lecture.